between then and the next call, where the commander in chief makes the call, what happens during that time? I think the biggest thing was 8.46 on the morning of September 11th. I was the commissioner. He said, a plane just hit Tower 1. I looked at the top of the building and I could see the damage. And I thought, that's no small plane. I've been in gun battles, I've been stabbed, I've been shot at. I'm gonna die suffocating in this room because I can't breathe. There is no greater police department in the world than the NYPD. Your personality right now, I'm sitting with you. You seem very chill, you seem very, you know, easy. but is that the personality back then? This is right after he came back from Canada. How would you know this? So today we are sitting down with Bernard Kerrig, who is known as the former commissioner of NYPD. I believe it was a three and a half billion dollar budget that he was managing, 55,000 employees reporting to him. And he was the commissioner of the correction department in New York, which both of them are the biggest organizations in America. I'm talking prison and I'm talking about uh, police department. He was running it during that time until he had some challenges he faced. And we're going to talk about some of that stuff. He's also got a new book that just came out uh, recently from jailer to jailed. He's also a former New York Times bestseller for another book he wrote years ago. So with that being said, Bernard Kerr, thank you for being a guest on Valley Tainment. Thank you, sir. I mean, that's a pretty interesting resume you have there. You know, when, when I... when I, I, I've been around. Yeah, when I read up on you and I go through, and the more I'm digging, you got recognized. You came up with this team system that Harvard recognized as a accountability system on how you were able to organize it and a lot of different organizations used it and you get credit for coming out with that. You've had over 30 awards that was given to you for different works that you've done. I mean, there's so many different things and then at the same time, the time where you were standing right next to President Bush and they're talking about you becoming who you become and then the fall right after that part. So prior to, let's go back to the beginning on this, this whole thing got started. Who was Bernard Carrick at 16 years old? If I was in high school with you, who were you? If you were in high school with me, you'd never know me because I, uh, I didn't go to high school that much. You know, I had a, a pretty rough upbringing. I was abandoned by my mother at three, three and a half. She was beaten to death and murdered when I was nine. We moved out of Newark, it was a rough place, and uh, moved to Patterson, which was equally as rough. It was just smaller. Uh, and more compact. I went to Eastside High School, which became famous, or I should in say infamous, in the major motion picture, Lean on Me with Morgan Freeman. Mm -hmm. I think there were probably about 25, 30 white kids in the school at the time. Out of 1,700, and I was one of them. That was a rough place to go to school, and it really wasn't an education. You learn how to survive, you learn how to fight. Ironically for me, fortunately, I got involved in the martial arts when I was 13. Uh, I got my black belt, my first degree black belt when I was 16, and I realized school wasn't, uh, wasn't going to do it. Uh, it wasn't a learning uh, institution center, it was a fighting center. So for me, the best thing to do was get out. I quit high school at 16. For the next year, year and a half, I worked for a moving company until I realized that humping furniture for a lifetime is not the way to go. And, uh, at 18 years old, I joined the military. And that's where my career sort of took off. So it was a combination of the martial arts, where I started to learn respect and discipline and physically, uh, you know, I, I was in phenomenal shape. And then I went in the military, I learned structure and I learned more discipline. And I found my niche in the military, I became a military police officer. I spent three years in the military, some time down at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. I spent uh, some time in Korea, got out, went to work for a federal task force, and then some of the guys that, that I actually met at Fort Bragg, they were retiring out of the military, out of the special forces units, and I get a call one day to work in Saudi Arabia, and this is like 1978. So this is a time long before anybody in this country knew anything about terrorism or you know, Muslims or Islam or, or any of that. I remember going home and telling my father, I'm going to Saudi Arabia to work. And my father's sitting at the dining room table and he looks at me, he goes, Arabia. He goes, you know, I saw a movie one time like Lawrence of Arabia. I think it's hot there. And that's about <laughs> as much as anybody knew. Like nobody had a wow. clue. So I went to Saudi. I went on an 18 month contract. I wound up staying two and a half years. 
I came back to the U.S., went to work as a cop uh, in, down in North Carolina, then moved up to New Jersey to a sheriff's department, started working there, and lo and behold, I went back to Saudi Arabia again. From 1978 to 1980, I was there the first time. Who were you representing in Saudi Arabia? Well, I if worked. if you're a cop in, in Jersey, you're going back as a, as a contractor? No, the first time I went as a contractor for an American firm. I was in the security division for the firm. They were actually building the King Khalid military city up on the Kuwaiti border. The second time I went back, I was the chief of investigations for the Royal Families Hospital in Riyadh. I was young, I was 27 years old, 28 years old, and that was from 82 to 84. And ironically, you know, it's kind of weird as I look back today because the king of Saudi Arabia today, King Salman, mm -hmm. was actually at that time the governor of Riyadh. And I used to hang out with his, the head of his security detail, who ironically was also the executioner. You know, he would behead people on Friday. So, you know, he'd go do his thing and then we'd go to like, we'd go eat. Did you actually see any of it or no? You didn't see any I've of the I've seen many. I've seen, I used to remember the numbers. I think I've seen about 22 beheadings. Uh, I've seen six dismemberments and one stoning. What does that do to your, to, to your brain, to your, I mean, how, how, does, does uh, it listen, numb you? Does it get you to a point where it's kind of like, you know, it's I, you not know, a big The deal? first time is, uh, is pretty shocking, uh, you know. When you see it the first time, um, it, it's almost like in your head, you're watching this and you're thinking, okay, that's like, there's some, you know, it's like a joke, like that's not real or whatever. Uh, but it's, uh, it's cold, it's uh, crude, it's rough. I stayed two, uh, another two years, 18 months uh, that time, came back, uh, went to work back in the sheriff's department that I took a leave of absence from. I became warden of that county jail. I was 30 years old, I guess. I took over the jail. This is uh, Jersey. This Jersey, is Jersey, Jersey. Sake County, uh, New Jersey, Sake County Jail. It was in Patterson, where I'd sort of grown up. And then uh, in 1986, I filed an application with the NYPD. From the time I was young, when I became an MP, I wanted to be a New York City cop, but I was I was traveling, I was in Saudi Arabia, I was in North Carolina, I was in Jersey, I'm back in Saudi Arabia. Now, the NYPD calls and they said, listen, dude, this is it. Nin July 1986 is your class. If you don't get in that class because of my age, you're done. You're never gonna go. Now, keep in mind, I had, I had a gold shield, I had stars, I had a white shirt, I had a car. I was the chief. I was 30 years old and the warden of the Passaic County Jail, one of the biggest jobs in New Jersey, and I had to make a decision. Am I gonna leave? Am I gonna, you know, give this up, give this chief jobs up, the chief's job, mm -hmm. and, uh, and take the job in the NYPD as a rookie cop? And I did. What, why did you, though? Look, it was a lifelong dream, and, and to me, there's no greater police department in the world than the NYPD. You know, when you watch movies, you know, if it's, if it's not the LAPD, you know, it's a, LAPD is a great department. However, nothing compares to this city. And, uh, you know, from the time I was younger, uh, that's all I wanted to do. So now really? here I am. From the time you were, re are you talking like high school type? When you like were high, high school, school I used to see the old? cops. I, I write about this in my first book, where I used to see these cops, you know, uh, most of the time they were slapping me around, telling me go home or, you know, get off the street or something. From the time I was young, I wanted to be a cop. The more I learned, the more I was exposed to the world, there's no bigger, no better than the NYPD, and that's what I wanted. So in July of 1986, I took off the gold shield, took off the stars and the white shirt. I went, went to the Brooklyn Technical Institute, right over here in Brooklyn. Ed Koch was there, raised my right hand, got sworn in, and I went back to Jersey and resigned. As soon as I got sworn in, I went back to Jersey, I resigned. To make sure it was real. To make sure it was real. <laughs> all my colleagues, all my friends, uh, you know, they pretty much said, you're nuts. Like, you're did, completely insane. Did you take a big kid with salary? I mean, I took a 50% pay cut. 50%? 50% pay cut. You've I was done that a couple times in your career. I've done it a couple yeah. times, and everybody's laughed when I've done it. And it's been hard. It was a hardship. But it's always worked out for the best uh, in, in the end, uh, you know. You, you follow your dream. You follow, you know, you follow what's in your heart, and uh, you know you'll be better off for it. I think. So from there, now you have this job. You're NYPD. 
you've wanted to be a cop, you've been looking forward to being an NYPD, what happens next? Yeah, I go to the academy, I'm probably one of the oldest guys in the academy, I'm 31 years old at the time. Most of the kids coming on the job, they're 20, 21, 22. My first assignment, I'm in Brooklyn for six months, my training, and then I get assigned right here, right down the street, Midtown South Precinct. I had a foot post on West 42nd between 7th and 8th Avenue, one block. And that one block, all day long, I don't care what tour you were doing, you were doing a days, afternoons, or midnights, doesn't mm -hmm. make any difference. For eight hours, the entire time you were on that block, you ran your ass off, you know, man with a gun, robbery in progress, you know, a rape in a movie theater, somebody jumped off the building, somebody threw somebody under a train, you name it, wow. for eight hours a day. Keep in mind, this is 1987, 88. This was the crack, the time of the crack e epidemic. It was a bad, bad place, and Times Square was booming 24 hours a day. So if you, want, if you liked this job, mm -hmm. If you wanted that type of action, you couldn't be in a better spot. And that's if you wanted it. If you wanted it. Were you the kind that wanted it? I wanted it. You I, wanted I, le I, left a, I left the chief's job to take it, to come So here. you wanted the action. I wanted, that's what I wanted. That's what I came for, and that's what I got. So I was in Midtown South for about a year and a half. In December of uh, 1988, uh, I applied for narcotics. And I wanted a detective shield. I wanted a New York City detective shield, a coveted gold shield. And I was told by everybody, the fastest way to get a detective shield is go to narcotics as an undercover. You can go to get a detective shield in a precinct squad. You can go to a robbery enhancement unit. You can go to narcotics as an investigator. But if you do all those, there's a track that gets you there probably within three to five years. If you go as an undercover, you get your shield in 18 months. And the reason that happens is because being an undercover, most of the time you have no vest, you have no gun, your sole function in life is to put yourself in harm's way to buy drugs. And didn't you at that time have earrings? You had, you wore leather pants, you had long, what, what was it? Because I read some part where you no, were. Well, I still have the holes. At one time I had like seven, you know, diamonds and a gold loop in my ear. I had a big goatee. I had a big beard. I had hair down. I had hair, period. But it was, at the time, it was down to the middle of my back. And I get transferred to narcotics. Where do they send me? Manhattan North. Harlem, Spanish Harlem, and Washington Heights. It was like a war zone. I remember going from Midtown South to Manhattan North, mm -hmm. sitting out in front of the 2-6 precinct, in front of the precinct station just standing out there talking to friends, and you'd hear gunfire, like on the block where the precinct is. Shots fired down here, shots fired around the corner, shots fired down the other end of the block. Is this post-mob? Like, has Joe Pistone already gone and done his six years of undercover with the Bonanno family when the 200 people got arrested? Has that already happened? No, it was like around, it was kind of sort of the same time. He was a little ahead of me. Was it, it a shock when he came out and you're like, what is this guy doing undercover? Because you're working in a different department. No, honestly, was. I didn't even know. I didn't even know. I heard, when I found out later, somebody called me from Patterson and said, did you see the news? And I said, no, and they told me all about it. And they said, you know who it is? I said, no. It says, Joe Pistone. I said, get the hell out of here. They said, yeah. I didn't even know he was with the FBI. Wow, that's the I, part to me that's so impressive for him to stay six years undercover like that. Yep. I mean, that's, yep. that's unheard of. Actors can act for a month. This guy acted for six years. Yeah, and listen, I, I was an undercover for uh, just over two years. It's not easy. So I, I did that, did really well in what I had to do, was involved in a couple bad things. Uh, I had some friends that were shot and killed. Uh, my partner was actually shot and wounded in a gun battle with me. I shot the guy that, that shot him. You and, got a medal uh, for that. You got, you got a... Yeah, a, I, I actually, uh, I got 30 medals from the NYPD alone, uh, including the Medal of Valor. Mm -hmm. Medal of Valor was for uh, Detective Hector Santiago was shot, a uh, guy fired through his windshield. And he put his hand up, shot him through the, through the arm, and he went out the door. The second round went through the headrest of the car. So luckily he was fast enough to get out of the car. Um, and I wound up taking down the guy that did it. And after narcotics, after that, I get transferred to the New York DEA task force. And that's a task force that consists of New York City cops, 
New York State Police troopers, investigators, and DEA agents. And I went to the task force. I was assigned to a phenomenal group with a guy by the name of Jerry Spezial. He was my co-case agent. And over the next three and a half years, we wound up in Costa Rica, Guatemala, Brazil, Ecuador, and Colombia. Did you do anything with Pablo's group, or that was... No, not Pablo's group. Uh, Ochoa was the main target in our case. Oh, you did something with Cali, though, didn't you? I yeah. read something. You did something with Cali. A bunch of major, major casework. We seized in, a, in about two years, over about a two-year period, in excess of about 10 tons of cocaine, enough to fill this room. 10 tons? Tons. Seized 60 million in cash. Brought back a whole, uh, you know, locked wow. up a whole bunch of bad guys. I loved that work. I liked working at the DEA. And in 1992, while this is going on, while I'm at DEA, I actually went to a dinner one night, uh, an Honor Legion dinner. It's a fraternal group in the NYPD of, of all these heroic cops. So if, to get in the Honor Legion, you have to have a certain medal or above uh, to get in, right, to be accepted. So I went to this dinner one night. One of the guys comes over and he says, listen, Rudy Giuliani, who was the former U.S. attorney, he's running for mayor, and we want you to introduce him. This is Mayor Dinkins? He's, he's, he was running against Dinkins. Yes, Dinkins. You know, I didn't know Rudy at the time, the, Mr. Giuliani at the time. So I said, okay, I'll introduce him when he comes in. It's like five, 600 cops. And at the time, I had, literally, I had hair down to here. I had a big beard. I had all these earrings. So they bring me in this thing. They introduce me to Giuliani. I shake his hand, and I go out and introduce him. And he gets this wild standing ovation uh, based on what I said. You brought him up. I, I, I brought him up. I introduced Got him. Got it. And lo and behold, you know, within a couple of days, uh, somebody called me and said, Rudy uh, called and wants to meet you for breakfast. As if for what? what? What's he want? You know, it's like, it's, it, I'm going to go meet him. I don't even own a suit. Like, you know, what am I doing? I went to meet him, and we had a great conversation over about an hour, hour and a half, and I talked about the city, about narcotics, about crime, about all the stuff that was going on in the city, and got to know him. And then from that point on, this is like in 1992, I guess, until 1994, I actually helped work on his campaign. I, uh, I brought in guys, volunteers, to work on his security detail, constantly fed him information. You know, a, a lot of the stuff that was going on in the PD that I thought would help the city. And then lo and behold, in 1994, he wins, and he becomes the mayor of New York. There's a lot of cities to be mayors in. Mayor of New York is not like being mayor of, you know, another city. This is... No, you, you know why? Because it, it, when you're the mayor of New York City, it's like a national position, mm -hmm. right? You have the UN. You have 180 different countries represented in New York City. You have 12 million people that live here, work here, visit here, go to school here on a daily basis. You have a bigger budget. The New York City budget is bigger than probably 40 state budgets. New York City budget is bigger than 40 state budgets. Yeah. So let me ask you, while you were dri this is the time when you were driving them on the weekends and you had one of your guys driving them on the weekday? Because that's what I read about. Well, is that what it is? Yeah, what? I drove them on the weekends once in a while, uh, but mostly I supervised. I oversaw the guys. He really was, trusted you. He really trusted well, you. He like, trusted me. Yeah. yeah, he really trusted you. You can tell uh, when, you, when you read about it. And I think I read somewhere where you and him both read God, watched Godfather over 50 times or something oh, like right. that. All he, the time. Yeah. All the time. I, st I still do it. I still do it now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, our favorite movie. I got to know him real well uh, between 92 and 94. I was with him a lot. So he wins, takes over in January of, uh, of 94. And in May, uh, I get a call from my command to go down and see him at City Hall. January of 95. I know May he calls you, but January of 95. Who are you in New York? Are you somebody that is already reputable, well-connected, people know who you are, you are seen as somebody that could be a future... No. In. Jan January of 95, I was in the Department of Correction. Rudy called me down earlier and said, look, I want you to... I'm, I'm putting in a new commissioner in correction. There was a riot. That's what happened. There was a riot at Rikers. A bunch of correction officers got hurt, and Giuliani said, look, I'm changing out... The, I'm getting rid of the commissioner. I'm bringing somebody new in. He's going to need help. I want you to go. I know you ran the jail in Jersey. Go and help him. So we agreed. I agreed. I'll do this for six months. 
not commissioner, you're helping. No, I was going to go as the executive assistant to the commissioner. Got it. You know, the executive assistant or the chief of staff for a commissioner, you're the buffer to the entire executive staff. You're the buffer to the outside community. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go there. I'm going to be his executive assistant chief of staff. Well, I went. And we agreed, Rudy and I agreed, I'm going for six months. Not sure what happened. I didn't leave for six years. I was there for six months. Right around the time that I was thinking I was going to leave, the mayor made a major change. He got rid of that commissioner. He brought in a new commissioner who was the head of probation at the time. And at 11 o'clock at night, uh, one night, I get a call to Gracie Mansion. And I walk in and he says, listen, the commissioner is going to be uh, leaving tomorrow, and uh, we're bringing in somebody new. He said, and I want you to work with him to do A, B, C, D, and all this stuff, he says. So I'm looking at him, and I said, listen, I can, I'll do what I can do. I said, but he's the commissioner, and I, you know, I can't, there's only so much I can do as the chief of staff. I, I don't want to. He goes, oh, I forgot. No, you're not going to be the chief of staff. You're going to be the first deputy. Now, the first deputy commissioner is the number two guy in charge. And I'm looking at him and I said, listen, could, could we talk about this? Because I ran a jail, a big jail, bad jail. This is the biggest jail system in the country. Rikers has 10 facilities. There's six facilities in the five boroughs. He's like, no, we just talked about it. It's fine, you're going to do this. So you were pushing back that you didn't want this job. I didn't, you know, I was nervous. You know, I, I've done it before. I actually thought I could do it. I wasn't worried about it, but it's a big job. Mm. And uh, he said, no, you're going to do it. And the next day, uh, he appointed the new commissioner, appointed me first deputy, and boom, we took off. So from that point on, uh, for the next two and a half years, I was the first deputy. And then the commissioner retired. Did you know this coming or no? No. Okay. So no. did he retire young? Was he? No. He he went to uh, he does what everybody else does. They go, they go to academia and the, you know, professor at this college that college. He came in one afternoon around two o'clock in the afternoon. He says uh, closes the door, and we had a great relationship. His name was Mike Jacobson. He says I got good news and bad news. I said well, what's uh, give me the bad news first. He said bad news is I'm leaving. I'm like really? He said yep. He says, I just want to see the mayor. He said, good news is you're getting a job. I said, no, I, th I think maybe that, that might have been the bad news part. And we laughed. And about an hour later, the mayor called me over to City Hall and says, tomorrow morning you're being appointed. This is the $835 million budget, 13,000 employees. This is that one you're talking right. about. 130,000 inmate admissions per year. Per year, yeah. About a $900 million budget. A, uh, you know, 13,000 staff. How old are you at this time? I am, let me see, that was uh, 1998. I'm going to take over, so I was 43. 42, 40. 43? Yeah. And, and let me ask you, your personality right now, I'm sitting with you. You seem very, you know, easygoing. You seem very chill. You seem very, you know, easy. But is that the personality back then? Because I've read some stuff about you. Like, you know what it is? Like, you know how you talk to somebody and they're at a different phase and you talk about how they were at their 20s and 30s you ask around and they say he was a fierce competitor he was cold he was vicious like if they talk about certain people in certain industries to do what you are doing you kind of have to be that way aren't you like aren't you paid to kind of be look I, I was an extremely aggressive manager i was a no-nonsense manager I think I'm very and you if you ask the people that work for me they'll tell you I'm extremely firm I'm very fair. My management style is pretty simplistic. If you work and you work hard and you produce, you'll get ahead. If you don't, you got to go. I'm, I'm not big on transferring failure. You see a lot of times the guy's in this position and he's doing this thing and he's not doing well or he's, he's messing up. Well, you know, a lot of bosses will take him and they'll, they'll move him from here to here. I'm not big on that because if he failed over here, he's going to fail over here. How you do one thing is how you do everything. That's you know, your philosophy. And, and, then, and then more importantly, you create dissension. You create animosity. You create sort of a cancer within the agency. Mm. So for me, it's sort of black and white. 
you do well, you produce. And that was the, that was the concept. You mentioned TEAMS earlier. TEAMS, the, the, the acronym, stands for Total Efficiency, Accountability, and Management System. It was recognized by Harvard, the, uh, the Innovations in American Government Program. And it's basically how I created the internal management system and accountability system for Rikers. Keep in mind, when I took over Rikers, or when I went to Rikers in 1995, we averaged 150 stabbings and slashings per month. We had the highest violence rate of any jail or prison system in the nation. It was the most violent, the most corrupt, the most dangerous, crime-ridden, dirty, filthy, mismanaged. And in six years that I was there, we took it from the worst of the worst in the country and turned it into an international model for efficiency, accountability, and safety. Some, some interesting stats on what happened well, during that period. There was a, there was a 90, 93 and 94% reduction in stabbings and slashings, a 40% reduction in overtime spending. Now keep in mind, when I took over, we were spending 112 million a year in overtime. I knocked that down by 40, 40 50%. Uh, assaults on staff, I knocked it down by 40. How did you do? What did you do with that? Like, like, is it almost if you're gonna play dirty, you have to play your game as well? What's a little bit of that it's, when you're It's a little bit them? of that, but you know what it is more than, more than that, far more than that. Look at Jack Welsh and mm -hmm. GE. How did he manage? He managed based on data, data collection. Home Depot, Walmart. How do they manage? What, what do they do to achieve uh, what they want done, right? They collect data. They, they have performance measures. Um, they, first of all, they have goals, of, goals and objectives. They create performance measures to get to those goals and objectives. And then they have an accountability system internally that goes after those metrics, goes after those performance measures. And you have to hold people accountable to get there. So slashings and stabbings, for example. I wanted, I wanted the violence reduced. Nobody understood this concept. Overtime was out of control. Sick time was out of control. For every day, you're, you know, the, the correction officers in the department at the time, you had in, their, in the budget 12 days a year sick time in the budget per correction officer. So they could be, up to, up to, they could be sick for up to 12 days. It was in the budget. Anything over that that they were over that 12-day period, $1.6 million. That's what it cost the agency. My average when I took over the Department of Correction was 22 days a year. That's $35 million that it cost the city. So when I came in and I looked at this, I said, you know what? The overtime and the sick time is driven by one thing. It's driven by violence. If you drive down the violence, you're going to drive down the overtime and the sick time. And everybody was looking at me like I had three heads. How do you drive down violence, though? Well, you go out. The violence thing is easy. The violence thing is holding the inmates accountable for criminal conduct. And, and here's what so I mean. So the punishment's a bigger punishment. When I came into the department, yeah. I the first stabbing, the first major bad thing that I saw, two Spanish kids took a black kid, held him down on the ground, took a chicken bone, sharpened, and they gave him about 70 stitches in his back. They carved LK into his back, the initials for Latin Kings. And my guys came to my office and I said, well, all right, what happens now? What are we doing with these guys? They said, well, they went to punitive segregation. I said, I know, but what did they get charged with? Well, they don't, we don't charge them criminally. Why? They said, because the Bronx DA won't prosecute it. And I said, wait, wait a minute. They held the kid down on the ground, they gave him 70 stitches. If I walked outside the facility, if I walked outside this hotel, and I went out on the street, and I took a small razor blade, and I nicked you in your hand, I'd get charged with assault, possession of a weapon, and who knows what else, right? In jail, you mean to tell me you could just about murder somebody and nobody's getting charged criminally? All right, that's gonna stop. So I called the Bronx DA and I said, listen, he said, I don't have the manpower to prosecute all these cases. I said, you have it now because I'm going to send people to you. I'm going to send investigators up to the Bronx. I'll do whatever you need, but I can't, this can't be a criminal haven for criminal activity. Interesting. So, how we, soon did that happen? How soon did that standard get applied? Within a month. Okay. Within and a then month. how soon did everybody, all the inmates, realize what's happening there? So, I mean, obviously, news travels pretty fast. In three months, we saw a substantial reduction. But then there's other things. I enhanced the emergency service unit to go out and start doing searches 
of the dormitories. You know, guys slash and stab, they need weapons, right? Where's the weapons? So you start looking for the weapons. You start holding the inmates accountable. You start holding the staff accountable to make sure that they're going out and doing the job they're supposed to do when they're on duty. That's the piece on the violence. And I'm, I'm making it simplistic. It's far more complicated, but simplistically, that's, that's sort of what we were doing. Now, when the violence comes down, you have less hospital runs. Say, you, say there's a, a confrontation between two inmates. Mm -hmm. This inmate gets cut, this inmate gets cut. They go to the hospital. This guy needs two officers on him. You need two on you. Those two come from a facility. So now you have four officers that have to go to the hospital. You have to backfill the positions at the facility. You now have four, eight guys on overtime. And people in, in you know, headquarters and in City Hall, they couldn't figure out where all the overtime was coming from. So let me ask you, what did you learn? It's because you mentioned Jack Welch. Are you reading business books you know, at that time or no? Uh, honestly, gonna, are you reading this? David Osborne wrote a book called Reinventing Government. And when I was tooling around with Giuliani in 1992, from 1992 to 1994, Giuliani had the book in the car, and I went and got the book for myself, and I read the book. What gets measured gets done. That's the, thing, the only thing I remember about it now. But I basically wow. took that book, the business concept of management, and said, you know what? It works in business. It works in Home Depot. It works in Walmart. It works in General Electric you and all these places. Wow. And I said, why can't it work here? Mm. So when you look at overall stats, right, violence, overtime, Routine maintenance. You know, they shut down a complete wing of a jail system, a complete wing, because they didn't have a key. Well, how long does it take to make a key? Well, it takes three days. Three days? It makes three, takes three days. I, I would have meetings and I would lose my mind. It takes three days to make a key? Well, you have to put the order and you gotta do a thing and then it's gotta get approved and then it's got this, really. So that key that took three days to get made cost me $200,000 extra for that three-day period because I had to move inmates to another facility? Are you crazy? No, making a key takes about four minutes. So we're gonna streamline the process to get to the key maker, and we're gonna make the key in about an hour. How much of that happens today in the government? It's amazing. I remember being in the Army, they used to say government spends money like they buy products that are not even worth that much and they're paying over for it just because somebody doesn't know how to negotiate and someone's not holding them accountable to well, be able to negotiate that, those contracts. Forget the negotiation. You just said the magic word. It's all about accountability. Accountability. The negotiation part is a part of the accountability. You need to hold people accountable. How much are you making at that time as a commissioner of a correction? Uh, About 140 grand a year. See, that's a problem as well, though. You know, because uh, when you look at how police officers get paid, right? So the current way, at least when you look it up, a police officer in Newark, who is not the safest place, versus maybe another city in uh, Jersey. Don't talk about Newark. My son's a cop in Newark. Is he, I know, I read that. That's great. The fact that he's 32 years old, right? Is he 33. 30, yeah. 33 years old, yeah. When you read that, and you say, okay, well, a cop in a safer <coughs> place, you know, Beverly Hills, 90210, nicer zip code, they're getting paid more, yet they're doing less to work because there is no crime than a guy in Detroit as a cop's making $36,000. It just doesn't make any sense. So the areas where they're working double time, they're getting paid less than the areas where they're not getting any kind of things going on, they're getting paid more. I think there's a little bit of a flaw there in the, in the, in the math. Well, there's a flaw. Listen, it's not only a flaw. The governments, the city governments, state governments, they can only afford what they can afford. How do you solve that, you though? Know? How do you solve that? And have you, to you know what? You have to hope. Yeah. You have to have hope that you have cops like my son. You know, and this is a true story, what I'm going to tell you. He, was, he started his career in Passaic County, where I, where I was. And about three years in, he got laid off, and I called him up to my house, and I said, listen, I'm going to help you get a job, and I got some great places that make an enormous amount of money. And I'm going to call the chief, and I'm going to see if you can go here, you know, to Ridgewood, New Jersey, or, you know, Paramus, New Jersey. Cops are, a, a white shield, uniform cop, making 120, 130,000 that's amazing. A year. That's amazing Crazy. right there. Okay. My son comes in, he says, uh, that's all right, Dan, I, I know where I'm going. I said, where are you going? He said, don't get mad, but I know where I'm going, and I've, I've already planned it, and I want to go there. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Newark. And I just looked at him, I said, dude. You going to Newark? 
it's probably one of the lowest paying jobs in the state, and it's like the eighth highest crime rate in America. You're going to Newark? And I said, why don't you come up here where I live? And he looks at me, and this is God's honest truth. He says, Dad, when your wife has geese in a swimming pool out back, she calls the cops. He goes, I am not chasing geese around a swimming pool. <laughs> That's what he said. So, so, so I, so I, I tried, I tried the money thing, you know, like he Being goes. Motivated. So he's a true believer. And I, and I said, listen, I said, what about the money? What about your career? He wow. goes, oh, I'm talking to the guy that took a 50% pay cut because he wanted to follow his dream. How's right? his relationship with you? Does he admire? Is there a level of admiration for well, you? Well, my it? son literally is my best friend. That's he's amazing. my best friend. You know, he's my closest confidant, he's my best friend I have today. the same relation with my dad. My dad's my best friend in the world. Now, I can't even describe it to you, that affinity. If I want to be happy, my I'm around best friend. him. My best friend. So I'm assuming you're a big Yankees fan. Absolutely. You were telling me earlier something about the logo. So what, well, here, what is the special thing about this Yankees here's the logo? Thing. See this logo? Yes. In 1877, the NYPD created a Medal of Honor. On that Medal of Honor is a logo just like this. That's where this logo came from. Wow. Because in 1923, the New York Yankees adopted it. So there's this close connection, there's this tie between New York City cops and the New York Yankees, and that's one of the reasons. And that's, you said who designed it? Tiffany's design it? Tiffany's uh, cast eyed it at the time. And you said the one when you got your uh, commissioner badge, the, the first one that was Shield. given in 18-something uh, yeah. was? Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy the Roosevelt was the, the head of the commission in 1897. Wow, 1897, and then years later you're the 40th. Yep, what a story. police commissioner. Let's go back to that part. So obviously you have certain systems that's working in the jail you're running. 13,000 employees, 140, 130,000 inmates that are coming through regularly. You have all these different responsibilities that you're doing, $900 million budget. You're changing the numbers. You're bringing on overtime from $120 million, 40% lower. All of these things, you made the decisions. Your key's gonna cost $200,000 because you gotta move people away three days. So now, how do you go from there to commissioner of NYPD? I mean, that's a, you know, you know how what does happens? that happen? The pre-story to that is, 11 days earlier, the New York City Police Commissioner, Howard Safer, resigned, retired. Retired, so this retired. was on a positive note, nothing no, negative. Just, no, no, it wasn't okay. negative, he, he was leaving, he was done. And the mayor had to fill that position. So at the end of the 11 days, there were two people in the running. Joe Dunn was the chief of department for the NYPD, he's the number three in command. Mm -hmm. And it was me that they were looking at. The mayor interviewed him, the mayor interviewed me, and for 11 days, we had no clue who it was. Nobody, we didn't have an idea. Are you talking to him throughout that 11 day period or not uh, at all? I There's had to no... meet with him, I, you know, oh, I constantly. See. So there's still talking. communication. There's communication, yeah. but he, he's not saying a word. And on August, I think it was August 19th, it was a Friday night, the mayor called my house about 11.30 that night and said tomorrow morning, you're gonna be appointed in New York City's 40th police commissioner. So you go from having 13,000 staff members to having 55,000. You go from a billion dollar budget to having a three and a half billion dollar budget. Most importantly, you're not dealing with the inmates, but you have to worry about the 12 million people that visit, live, work, go to school in the city on a daily basis. The next morning I went to City Hall and I was appointed uh, New York City's 40th police commissioner. How'd you feel at the time? I can't say how I felt at the time. I was sort of floating on a cloud. It's sort of overwhelming, you know. It's 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 a big, enormous job. Because you know, sometimes when you're in that moment, it goes so fast that you don't even have time to appreciate it. Yeah, but you know what? I, I've had in my career, I've had about four or five of those. Correction commissioner, getting appointed as commissioner, getting appointed to the NYPD as commissioner. I remember in 2003, I was sent to Iraq by President Bush as the interim minister of interior. And I remember getting there and I was there for less than 24 hours. And my press guys come to me and they said, Commission, the press, they know you're here now, so you have to do a press conference. So we're gonna go over and do the press conference. And I said, okay. So where are we going? We're going to this big hall in, this, in the Republican Guard Palace. And we get over there and there's this big, massive throne. That's the, only, that's the only way I could describe it. It's a throne made out of like tiger skin or leopard skin or something. I, I forget what it was. And they said, okay, you're gonna go up on the, on the dais up there and you're gonna sit in that chair. And then, and I said, guys, I gotta sit in that chair? They said, yeah. I said, why? They said, well, because that's where the press is. 
can't you get a normal chair? And he said, listen, that was Saddam's chair. Just go up there and sit in the chair. And I can remember thinking in my head, really? That was Saddam's chair? Like, Saddam had meetings here like two months ago? And I'm sitting in his chair. So it's that kind of stuff. In my career, I can remember things like that that was kind of nuts. So, okay, so now you're NYPD commissioner. Everyone around the states knows you. You're always on TV. You're being written about, talked about, paper. Every day there's something because you're the man in charge. You're, you're, you're the guy that's right. running the whole show. What's between then and the next call, and I'm talking the call from the top where the commander in chief makes the call, what happens during that time? I think the biggest thing was uh, 846 on the morning of September 11th. I was the commissioner. I was in my office. Um, uh, I was actually taking a shave. I had just finished exercising. Um, I'm standing there taking a shave, and uh, my chief of staff came in banging on the door. I opened the door, and I said, what is it? What, what, are, you, what are you doing? He said, a plane just hit Tower 1. And I said, all right, calm down. And I thought, it was, I, thought I was going to look out the window and see you know, a small aircraft sticking out the window or something. I looked at the damage of the building. I could see it on, a, I had a TV above our tread, my treadmill, and I could see the damage. So I actually walked out of my office with the towel wrapped around me, went into my conference room, pulled back the shades, and I could see the building. It's only about a quarter mile away. I looked at the top of the building and I could see the damage. And I thought, that's no small plane. I don't know what that is. I even had doubts whether it was a plane at all. I didn't know what it was. I called the mayor. I said, look, I'll meet you at 7 World Trade Center, which was right across the street from Tower 1. That's where our command center was. Is that 7 World Trade Center or 75 Barclays? Oh, 75 Barclays is where you guys No, 75 right. Barclays is where I got trapped. Right. I went downtown, uh, went to go to 7 World Trade. And when we got to Vesey Street, there were cops on that corner stopping the traffic. And my guy said, look, I, I got the commissioner in the car. And a sergeant ran up to the car and he says, he salutes me and he says, commissioner, you can't get onto the block. He said, they're jumping. And I said, what? He said, they're jumping. And I had no conception of what he was talking I didn't know what he was talking about. I got out of the car and I looked down the street and, you know, people were jumping. You, and, you, you know. saw that. You, you saw that taking place. Yeah, but uh, listen, I know people saw it on TV, but in the early minutes, in that first... I'd say in that first 30 minutes, in that first 15, because I was down there within seven or eight minutes, I probably watched two or three dozen people jump. Uh, they were coming down some two or three at a time. And they were landing on Vesey. They were landing in the courtyard between Tower 1 and Tower 2. And they were hitting the overhangs of the building. So you could hear it. I was up the block. I was about 100 yards up the block. And you could hear them hitting that overhang and, uh, you know, exploding. So the mayor got the air within three or four minutes after the second plane. I was standing in front of Tower 1 and Tower 2 when the second plane slammed through the north side of the tower. I could hear the aviation uh, pilots, or helicopter pilots in the NYPD, saying that a second airliner just slammed through Tower 2. And that's when I realized we were under attack. What happens next? Giuliani gets there within two or three minutes. I told him what I had just seen. We actually walked down to West Street. We went to the command center where the fire department's executive staff was. So it was the first deputy commissioner. It was the chief of department, the chief of operations, their chaplain, father judge, a couple NYPD guys that I knew. We talked to them. We were there about 10, 15 minutes, and we left, went back to 75 Barclay Street where I initially met him. We were going to put him in an office there so that he could call the White House. Um, we wanted to make sure we had air support. We wanted to make sure we were getting resources from the government. And he, uh, he went into this small office at 75 Barclay. We're standing there. Our staff is all around us. He's sitting in front of me on a phone. He's talking to the White House, and all of a sudden he hangs up the phone, and he looks at me and he says, that's not good. I said, what is it? He said, I think they said that the Pentagon just got hit, and they're evacuating the White House. I didn't even have time to grasp what he said, because as he said that, the building we were in started to shake, like a freight train was coming through the side of it. The door slammed open, and Joe Esposito was my chief of department. The door slams open, and he yells, everybody get down, it's coming down. And I didn't know if he was talking about the building we were in, or something else. 
all the windows blew out, the doors blew open, the place filled with dust and gas and debris. And it was over in about 12 seconds and it was mass chaos outside. Um, we couldn't breathe, uh, we, so we, we actually got trapped inside there. We couldn't get out the way we went in because that was on the outside. And so we were gonna try to get through the building. All the doors were locked. We were physically trapped in this office, suffocating. And all of a sudden, one of the doors opened and there's these two Spanish guys that were maintenance guys with a ton of keys on them. And I said, Are those keys for these doors? He said, yes, sir. I said, open these doors. I need to get to Church Street. I need to go that way. And he opened the doors and off we went. And we got out of the building. Otherwise, I, I could remember actually thinking, I've been in gun battles, I've been stabbed, I've been shot at. I'm gonna die suffocating in this room because I can't breathe. We eventually got out. And Mayor Giuliani is with you the, the entire time or you put him at that office to just... Uh, no, no, he was with us. The entire time? The whole time. And you're trying to get into Church Street, so he's gonna and be... And we, we did, we, you know, we got through the doors, we got out on the church. You know, it was weird, uh, when we got to Church Street, that building, the whole front of that building is solid white, you know, big windows, floor to, floor to ceiling windows. And I remember walking into that lobby and looking out at those windows and they were white. They were solid white. And I'm like, what is that? What's else? What is that? We went over to the circular vestibule door, pushed the door open, got outside, and there were two things that struck me. Now, we are literally, we're probably three or four blocks from the towers, right? There was this much dust on the ground where we were, all over, and there was no sound. There was absolutely no sound. No birds, no sirens, no horns. No, nothing. It was like when you walked out that door, it's like somebody put earphones on you and you couldn't hear anything. Wow. It was really strange. And then somebody told us that the building came down. So at this moment, Mayor Giuliani gets a call. He realizes Pentagon got hit as well. White House is being evacuated. All eyes on New York. Everybody's watching to see what's gonna happen. What happens next? We got out on the Church Street. You know, when you talk about leadership and you talk about some of the stuff I've done, and. People credit me for things, my management style. I remember getting out onto Church Street and the mayor turning to his press secretary and says, get me a pool camera right now. And I can remember, and I know him well, and I can remember looking at him thinking, really? We're gonna do a press conference here? Like, I don't know if this is the time, but it wasn't the time. And that's not what he was doing. He already knew in his mind that the entire world's watching, and somebody has to tell them that it's gonna be okay. And when you think back to that day and you look at that footage, mm. you'll see him, we're literally walking. I mean, we're, we're in motion. And he, they get the pool camera, they get him up to him, they get the microphone, stick it in his face, and he said, listen, here's what I want. You know, people stay in your house. You know, don't panic. It's bad, yes, but it's gonna be okay. We're gonna get through this, and between that and the first press conference, which was later that afternoon, I can't tell you how many people, thousands of people, that have come up to me in airports, walking down the street, in different towns, in the West Coast, uh, all over the country, where I've been, where people have come up to me and say, you made me feel safe because I had no damn idea what was gonna happen. And if it wasn't for you and it wasn't for Giuliani, I don't know what would happen. I don't know what I was thinking, but you guys made me feel safe. Even, even people who disagree with you, they, they've said that as well. Even people who are kind of like, you know, I don't like the way he handled X, Y, Z. When it came down to how that 9-11 event was handled, we wouldn't Listen, want to have anybody we, else in that position than we, him. We did the best we could, but I think, I think the combination worked and worked well. That, led to President Bush giving you a call. How many years after, that's in 01, I think 04 is well, when he I called. Leave in, I leave in 02, I leave in January of 02, I retire. I'm done with my government service, so I thought, uh, until May of 03. I was actually at, you know, I'm in Manhattan, I'm going to Barney's to buy some shirts, my cell phone rings, and it's, uh, it's somebody at the Pentagon, they said the President wants you to come meet with Secretary Rumsfeld, and then I wound up going to Iraq for four months as the Minister of Interior to get them up and running, and to get the new Minister of Interior in place. My wife wasn't too happy about that, given it was a war zone. But I went, I did what the President wanted, got it done, came back. Then I thought my government service was over for sure. Then in December, you know, the President gets reelected, November of 04. Within about a week after he gets elected, uh, reelected, I get a call from the White House. Uh, they're sending me some questions. 
and they send me those questions. Uh, is this Dana Powell or Dina Powell? Dina Powell. Dina Powell. Yeah. Dina, man, you got a good memory. Yeah. Damn. Dina Powell sends me some questions, answer them, get it back to us, at which time I find out that I'm being considered to take Tom Ridge's job in Homeland Security. I've already run the largest police department, largest jail system. This was a job, it was a new job. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security had just been created under Ridge. He put it all together. 22 federal agencies and a staff of about 180,000 people. I was ready. I, th I thought I could do it. I knew I could do it. The president knew I could do it. We had that conversation, him and I, actually. Is that when he had just come back from Canada? Uh, How flight? would you know this? Like Because I've studied your story. And wow. so the night before, there's a part the night before where you were in tears because you turned down the job the first time. Then this, I'm like, I'm curious to know how, what was the, you know, you were conflicted. What were you thinking about the night where you and your wife are like, babe, I don't know if I want to, like, I don't know what that conversation was. You know like. what it was? It was the Thanksgiving. It was either the night before or the night after Thanksgiving. <clears throat> you know, they called me and said, Look, this is it. You know, the, the, the president's going to ask you if you want the job. And I thought, if I take this job, like, my, my life savings now at this point is pretty substantial. You know, I've been in the private sector for three years. I was making good money. But I'm going to have to give up a substantial piece of this in the millions. To, you know, you have to be specific. That's 100,000 shares at $50 a share. No, it was like, it was like $8 million. They were basically telling me, you got to forfeit. Yeah. And I was this like, is the Taser company, right? Taser, yeah. right, Taser stock. And I'm like, I, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know if I want to do that. And my wife was like, is it really worth it? I don't know. I don't think so. I told my wife, I said, okay, I'm done. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. You sure? I said, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to wait until they call, and then I'm going to tell them. So Dina calls. I said, look, I got to talk to you. I don't think this is going to happen. And she said, hold on. And Andy Card got on the phone. And Andy Card was the chief of staff of the president. I forget the, the entire conversation, but he basically says, look, you know, there's all that stuff in the press where the president's looking at this guy and that guy and this person and that yeah. person. He's only interested in one person. He wants you to take the job. And I remember, I'm sitting in my office and my wife's sitting yeah. there across from me and she's looking at me and she's going, no, 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 don't, no. And I'm like, and I'm going, yes, sir, uh-huh. And I'm scared to death. Like I don't want it. I don't want to say nothing out loud that's going to give her away that I'm doing this. And I agreed. I'm going to go see the president. I hang up the phone. And I told her. I said, "Look, I can't say no to the president. I'm not going to do it." I said, "You know, let me. I'm going to go see him." And this was like this was like I think on a Monday or something. So I got to go see him on Wednesday, and I get in the car and I drive to D.C. Me. And Tony Carbonetti, uh, Giuliani's chief of staff, we drove down together. We went to the JW Marriott, and I would have forgot that if you didn't remind me. And I can remember the president flying over the building, hearing the helicopters. And Tony, we're sitting in the hotel suite, and he looks at me and says, okay, start getting ready, because he's going to call you as soon as he lands. And as soon as he got in, boom, they called. I went over to the White House. Would They snuck me in, mm -hmm. got to the White House, and the president, uh, I walked in, give me a hug. He said, I'm looking for a Secretary of Homeland. You want it? I said, yes, sir. He said, sit down. He said, I want to tell you why you're picked. And, uh, and that was it. So in that moment when uh, uh, you're going through that decision, this is, this is not a regular position. Now you've been commissioner of uh, New York Correction, commissioner of NYPD, sat in the chair with Saddam Hussein. You've had some in interesting experiences there. And now you're being called by the president to say, here's Homeland Security, it's your job. While you're going through that, and I'm talking to Scaramucci earlier, are you sitting there thinking about all the research, due diligence, everything that's about to happen? No. And you're not thinking about that in that moment? No. Got it. So you're not thinking any, you're like, hey, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to be called up on, and I know how to handle this. I'm the best guy you're for it. You're thinking about the job. Got you're it. You're thinking about, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure Anthony... You know, he's focused on the job. You're focused on the job. You're focused on what's going to happen. What, what do you have to do? You know, and, and I, in my mind, I was four steps ahead of it already. You know, okay, staffing, agencies. They, I, you know, I was, I was there already in my head before I even talked mm. to the president. When I knew I was being considered, I wasn't thinking about anything but how am I going to do this and have as much success is I've had my whole career, I've never failed, ever. In fact, not only have I never failed, I had enormous success. I'm going to do the same thing here. So that's where my head is. What you never realize, what nobody realizes, unless you are positioned for one of these jobs, you come out of high school, you go to college, 
you go to law school, you clerk for a federal judge, you go to a major firm, you become a U.S. attorney, you become a judge, and then you get a job. And the whole time, you're like Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, right? Down the road until you get to where you're going. If you've had a life, getting these jobs are hard. And I can remember there were times when I was actually being vetted. We had a conference room in our office, Giuliani and I. It, was, it had to be 25 feet long, 30 feet long. Major conference room. Here? In New York City, right. Times Square. In that conference room, on the conference table, every set of taxes that I had since I was 18 years old, on that table. Come on. No, I'm not joking. Every set of taxes. Every set of taxes. This is wanted. before you take the job or once you took the job? Once, you, once you're in the process. Once so you, once you're being once you accept Homeland Security. Homeland Security. Once you accept the nomination. Does the world know about it yet or not oh, yet? Oh, yeah, they know. Okay. Because the president announced I mean, that's it on when that the, Friday. Okay. So from that point on, you got to, you know, every speech you've ever getting, given, every application you've ever filled out for a job, every, every taxes, every year's taxes, all this stuff, you have to have, I had a group of people sitting around there, like lawyers and analysts and all these people, just going through this stuff, one thing after what another. What are they looking for? Oh, because of this one thing, you should resign. Oh, because this They're is not looking for inconsistencies. They're looking for, I think most importantly, what they're looking for are, where could you get tripped up in Congress at a congressional hearing? Who's going to not like your position Got it. that you said in this speech, right. this thing? Who's not going to like that and have a problem with it? And what's ironic, as I learned, I'd say 90% of the people in Congress that would scrutinize me, they can never even get my job. They can never get that job. Of course. They couldn't be vetted. Right. They've never had an executive position. They've been in politics the whole time. They couldn't do it. They can't do it, which is kind of frustrating when you're going through this process, especially when you flunk out of the process because you come to the realization that the people that scrutinized you or that had all this negative stuff to say about you, they couldn't hold a candle to you. Let me ask you this. So, there, you know, you, this kind of takes me to, you know, the movie A Few Good Men where the whole part's going back and forth and you can't handle the truth. You want the truth. You can't. Uh, and then at the end he says, you need me. Like, you know, like not everybody can do my job. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, code red. Code red, you know, you got to do code red, but we don't put it in the manual that there's code red. No one talks about it, okay? What they did to, you know, private such and such, Santiago, I think that was a kid's name. And then you sit there and say, it has to be an SOB to be able to run, you know, that camp to be able to do the work. Right? But here's, you know, that's a really, really good point. It's a really good point, especially that thing, you need me, that's logic but that's not reality. Because those guys in Washington, they don't give a damn, really. They don't give a damn. But they what they were the things you. that came up? What were the things? So I read all of them. I read every single one of the controversial stuff that came up on Yeah, I had, a, I had a nanny. You I, had you a know, nanny, but okay. I, I had and that was what, that 14 I, months that taxes weren't paid for her, right? That was 14 months or whatever the number was. Yeah, and I, ironically, what a lot of people don't know, as soon as I withdrew, I actually, I paid the, pe the taxes, I paid the penalties, I paid the fines. You $220,000 in fines, I think. Well, whatever it was. Yeah. I, I forget what yeah. it was. I paid all that stuff immediately after, like in probably January, February of 05. Then there's all these investigations that start, right? And you start getting scrutinized. The press is pushing one way. The prosecutors are following up the press, and they're feeding each other. They feed each other. So you go through this process where now it's no longer about the nanny. Anything you've ever done in your entire life that anybody has a problem with, they have now crawled out from under a rock and they're making calls to every press. I get it, but what was them like, okay, if you went to prison and you did three years, I think a lot of people should be doing the same time as well. And they have similar cases, if not worse. One of them was the one I pulled up that was the quarter million by the Israeli businessman that gave you a no interest free no, it's completely uh, false. So, so that's what I read. So okay. I'm, I'm going to kind of list some of them that I remember. And okay. Use, so now, it's reported. Do you know which one I'm talking it's, about? It's yeah. reported. It's on Wikipedia. And for some reason, they refuse to pull it off. I can't figure out why. An Israeli businessman gave me an interest-free loan that I never paid back. And, it, and I was charged with a bribe and bribe receiving. That's what it says on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is, it was no interest-free loan. 
it was a personal loan. I paid interest. I was not charged with bribery, and there was no bribery charges. Okay, so, so, th that's, so that's number one. So put that that's aside. One. Okay, but but here's here's why that became an issue because that loan that he lent me was actually when I went to Iraq. I was built in a house, and I was built. I didn't know how much time I was going to be in Iraq. I was building a house. I was making a really good a lot of money. And I needed to make sure that while I was gone, I'm going to be making 140000 a year now. And I was what making a million. What year is this? This is... This, this is, is 03. Oh, so this, this, is, this is post you being the CEO of uh, Giuliani's company? It was during, during that time. During that time. Is it you started your own? Or is it you no, no, working Julian as a CEO together. of Rudy Giuliani's company? Right. I was okay. the CEO. Got it. Because so I know I'm, you left afterwards and you started your own deal. You had some contracts. But, but in 03, we're working together. Got it. I get a Got call it. from the White House to go to Iraq. I said yes. When I said yes, I have to accept their salary. Got it. So I go from making a million dollars a year to making 140000 a year. So I want to make sure that I can huh. finish my house. Yeah. I borrow 250000 from a friend, and I go about my business. On the conflict of interest or on the financial disclosure, I don't even remember what it was, one of them, when my accountants and my staff, we started filling out all the stuff, because I didn't make monthly payments on this thing, on this loan, it was just a personal loan that I was going to pay back. We didn't put it on the conflict of interest report. That was a federal charge. That is a federal charge. Yeah, it's false statement or Got it. whatever. It's right. a federal charge. Okay, fair enough. So, so that's one. The nanny, remember I said I paid the taxes, I paid the fines, I paid the months. But okay, so but listen, six counts. Is that a charge federal charge with. though? Yes. The nanny is a federal charge. Listen, they charged me. Now, it was they considered two years, right, that I had the nanny. Okay. So two, two counts of failing to pay payroll tax, two counts of failing to put it on my IRS documents, and two counts of failing to tell my tax preparer. So for the nanny that I paid cash, six federal counts they charged me. I got news for you. I challenge you. I challenge you to go in any court docket in this country and see where they've done that to anybody else in the country, never happens. So let me ask you another question here uh, on that. The part with Carl Rove, I don't know how you feel about Carl Rove, and I don't know your relationship with them. The other part where you read about him and say, well, this was a, a way that Carl Rove brought you in to taint you indirectly to yeah, taint that's Rudy, nonsense. so that's mm -hmm. nonsense. So you're not, you're not putting any value behind no, that no, one. No. Okay, so you're not even saying no. that could that's, be a reason. That's the, uh, maybe I'm talking for the nomination, for, so, so Mayor Giuliani wouldn't get the next nomination. No. Okay, no. got it. So now, so this happens, you go up, you apologize, you say you let the people down, you, all you said is please uh, allow me to come back and be able to spend time with my wife and kids. The sooner I can do that, allow me that. But you didn't go out there and say deny any of it. You just kind of said, hey, if I did it, it I did it. It is what it is, and yeah. I'll, I'll deal with it. Yeah, so, okay. And that reminds me of a scene from Judge, which I don't know if you've seen the movie The Judge with Robert Duvall. I don't know if you've seen it or not. The end scene, you got to see it. It's a very unique, especially you. I think you would really appreciate the ending of that movie. It's with Robert Downey Jr. and Duvall. And if you know Duvall, obviously you know no, Godfather. You would love Duvall and how he handles it. He said, if I did the crime, I want to pay for it because I've been a judge for the last 42 years. If I did it, I did it. So now you go and you do three years. You come out. That entire process, that happens pretty fast, right, when you go through that. What are you now thinking to yourself that you're out, you know, and what, what did that time that you did in prison, what did that do to you? Did that help you think it's, about it? What no, are you thinking at it's this? Not only, it's not only the, the time in prison. It's from the beginning of the process to the time I came home, it's all one. It's all one because it's, it's like this blur of, it's a blur of s stuff that you go through that you never expected to go through. How do you get targeted? How, you know, really, are, are they attacking me because of this nanny thing? Really, you know, they're gonna charge me for this you know, not having the loan on a, uh, a financial disclosure. Yeah, why did you say, yeah, I did the crime. If I did it, you know, I have to face the crime. Well, I'll tell you why. First of all, when you are fighting federal criminal charges, it's a fight for your life, literally. It's a fight for your life because that felony conviction is a life sentence of collateral consequence that's going to crucify you personally, financially, and professionally. 
So that, that's number one. If you fight it, if you say, I didn't do it, is that, is, is that what the fight is? Or well, you can't win. You can't win. You only have the constitutional rights you think you have if you have the money to pay for them. How much influence did Mayor Giuliani or President Bush have at the time to be able to help you with that? The only one that could have helped me was President Bush. Why didn't he? Most of them will not. Why, why not, though? He, he, he nominated, he brought you up. He, it doesn't make any difference. Do you have any hard feelings about that at all? I get it. Uh, most politicians don't have the courage to stand up and say this is wrong. Was there any motive behind it or was it just, just you know? No, 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 they just don't have the courage just, to okay. do it to politicians. It. You can't fight the U.S. government unless you are a multi, multi-millionaire or billionaire. You just can't. And I'll explain why. During the whole course of this thing, from 2006 to 2009, you really go back to 05. 05 to 09, I was averaging um, legal bills of about 100,000 a month. 100,000 a month. Then closer to the end, we're up to 150 a month. So in October of 2009, I was remanded the judge didn't like the fact, in my case, my attorney, one of my attorneys, he sent an email to the Washington Times and he said, be in court on this day because we found prosecutorial misconduct, we found the government suppressed evidence, they suborned perjury, found all this stuff. Be in court on that day. Well, the judge found out. When he found out, mm. instead of addressing it, mm -hmm. he remanded me, revoked my bail, put me in jail, and told me he's going to suspend my attorneys again for the third time. Well, at this point, I'm out of money. I, I can't keep doing, I can't, you can't keep doing this. And in October of, of 2009, in that month that I was remanded, my legal bill for one month was, for a month, 30 days, my legal bill was $476,000. How do you, how do you fight that? How do you do that? And at that point, I told my attorneys, I said, go see the prosecutors, tell them I quit. I'll take a plea. Tell me what I'm pleading to. I'll plead whatever they want. I can't do this anymore because my wife and kids are going to live in the street if I keep doing it. That is the problem with the federal system. And, and that's being targeted when you get into the system and you see the flaws and failures and you see you know, I thought it was just me. Let me ask you this other question. You know, I had I have friends who were cops. When I got out of the military, a lot of people become cops. You know, the whole thing is when you get out of the, you were in Fort Bragg, go be a cop, you know, go be a firefighter, right. go be UPS, you'll get 10 points, you get whatever right, that right, thing's right. on your score. So my friends want to be cops, and I would ask myself, so tell me, what is it to be a cop? And one of my friends got kicked out of being a PD himself. So one day I'm sitting there, I said, so tell me what happened. And you know how there's like different stories. There's a one story which is what? Man, I, I just did what everybody else was doing, and da 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 right. da. And I said, "Yeah, but what happened?" Three months later, six months later, twelve months. I mean, this is my buddy. This is we're hanging out together. I mean, he would tell you the story right now himself. I will tell you one thing that happened. So for him, what he was doing was he was doing steroids and was selling steroids to other uh, cops. And you know, cops do that a lot. It's a it's a whole different thing. He said the one thing that happened with me is I really started thinking I'm above the law, and I started using some of my power against civilians and I started feeling within my family. I started feeling with my wife, with my mom and dad, with my siblings, my peers. I felt like I was above the law because you couldn't say anything to me because I have the badge and it was an LAPD guy. And that badge gave me a lot of power. Right. So do you think sometimes, maybe even yourself or your career, because you're looking back right now reflecting, right? Like for me, when I sit back and I reflect on my life and I say, okay, I used to live in Iran, we were bombed on, it was a very difficult time for me as a kid, my parents got a divorce, I had very bipolar type of people in my life that were complicated and not the loving, most incredible you know, experience that you want, and then boom, we live in a refugee camp, I get stabbed at 12 years old at the refugee camp, I come to the States, I go to high school, I have a one point GPA. Now, in my life, it's been a pretty, you know, a mother side communist, dad side imperialist. Like, it's a lot of mess That's that I've right. gone through, right? So I don't have a degree, I don't have a four year, two year degree. And I go back, I think about what could I have done differently, this is the mistake I made that. When you go back yourself, did you see some trends where you were kind of like, I can get away with this because I'm such no. and such? Not at all. No. Zero. No. At all. No. You're not thinking, I wasn't thinking I did anything wrong. In fact, most of the counts that I pled guilty to, that I actually pled guilty to, there were accounting issues that my accountants dealt with. I didn't really, 
I didn't fill out my taxes. I didn't do that stuff. So how do you live today with all that? Like, is there any bitterness in you? Like, you know, knowing how much more you could have contributed, to, you know, service. Is there anything where you could say I could have done this differently? Because it sounds like you don't have. Yeah, you know what I could have done differently. Stuff. I could have, you know, I could have, uh, I could have been, you know, the goody two shoes, uh, you know gone to school and, you know, clerk for the judge and gone to law school and all this stuff, I, I could have done that I, and I could have gone that route, um, but I didn't. And, uh, you know, I personally think I'm, I'm satisfied with what I've done for this country. Um, you know, I'm sorry the stuff happened the way it happened. Um, if I could have done something differently that I thought of at the time. Well, then let's, let's wrap up with this final thought. I was in UK last week and I was interviewing a few uh, people. And uh, we talked about the rece is it recidivision uh, rate. Right. And uh, the numbers came up for America, right? Right. And I think U.S. is 56% after, 56% of inmates go back a year later, 67% three years later, but 76% five years later. Right. Like the system is created to get you to go back into prison, if that makes any sense, right? Yep. So. You know, that's how the system is set up. What do you think about the current uh, uh, system that we have ourselves? And if there was anything you would change with the current system, we have, we have a lot of people in prison that sold weed or, you know, you know, did nothing like, you know, major, but they're still in prison nowadays. And it's a pretty high cost. I think the number I saw was like $76 billion a year. Let me help year. you. The prison system, the criminal justice system in America is horrendous. It's horrible. It's horrible for a number of reasons. One. We put people in prison that shouldn't be there. Prison is for bad guys. Bad guys do bad things. Prison is for people that you want to protect society from. That's what prison should be for. That's what it was originally mm. created for. That's not what we use it for. We put commercial fishermen that caught too many fish in prison. Somebody sells a whale's tooth on an eBay. We put him in prison. We take a young black kid that sells three dime bags of marijuana and we charge him federally and give him 55 years. Are you kidding? That's crazy to me. That's insane. So what do you do about it? Insane. Well, you do what I've done for the last five years since I get out. You fight Congress, who I think is completely inept most of the time. You fight them to change. You fight them to create change. We're sitting right now on a historic piece of legislation that I think is going to be it's going to be voted on within the next two days. Is this the email you were talking about that you got? The it? first step back. Yeah, got it. Right. I've been, I've been pushing this for five years, but this is only a small part of the criminal justice system. You can't put people in prison, suck all the societal values out of them, institutionalize them, turn them into monsters, and think you're going to send them home and everything's going to be okay. It's not. That's why that recidivism rate is so damn high. Mm -hmm because we're not doing anything for them. You have to do something. If you're gonna put them in prison and you're gonna destroy their lives, well then at least do something so that when they get home, they can get a job, a real job. Then they go to work, take care of the family, take care of their kids, pay taxes. Because as it stands right now, we don't do none of that. You know, if you're watching this right now, obviously uh, uh, if you're uh, as uh, enamored by the story that uh, Bernard Carrick has with the different experiences he's had and you know, what he's had to done, um, as I am, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what we're talking about here at the end. So whether you comment here or you send me a tweet at Patrick, are you on Twitter as well or no? no. What's your Twitter handle? Bernard your, Carrick. Okay. Tweet us at Patrick Bay David or Bernard Carrick and let us know what you took away from today's interview. Because for me, it's a lot of connecting the dots with all these different stories. And uh, I hope we go in a direction where something happens with this, because at this pace, you're getting young uh, boys and young, you know, that are making mistakes that ruins the rest of their lives, and they're going into prison learning even other it's bad habits. It's a life habits. sentence. It's a life sentence. Yeah, I see it a lot. Of collateral consequence I see it a lot. that they can't get out from under. Yeah, but I want to hear from you. I'm curious to know what you think about it. Again, Bernard Carrick, sir, thank you so much for thank being you. a guest on Valuetainment. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Yes.